think it's a big transition. Uh, whether it's painful or not depends on how decisive Germany is, how decisive the entire industry is, and how decisive we are going for the real big parts of the transition. Number one is we need more renewable energy at prices that are also for the industry in an international context very competitive. That's number one. Number two is we need to also make sure that we get rid of fossil fuels as quickly as possible and make ourselves more independent of single sources, so, uh, so to say. As we see currently, our dependency mm -hmm. on Russian gas is very high. That means when we short term would have to shift, for example, away from Russian gas, that would be really painful for the industry, painful for the industry because there's very limited opportunity to compensate for that. It would cost hundreds of thousands of jobs, that's my personal belief, and it would also really hammer down the German industry in that context. So what we need to do is make sure that we now, with full force, really transition to renewable energies and get rid of fossil fuels. But there are some technologies out there which are here and present and ones that are very exciting but not cost effective yet. I'm thinking of things like what Linda are doing on green mm -hmm. energy, green hydrogen, right. not, not, not blue, not another colour, but right. green as well. How far away are we from real technologies that could make a stunning difference getting to scale? Well, that's the key point, getting it to scale and also put it at the right place. Because if you're, for example, sitting in areas where there's a lot of sun, you can get much more out of the resources you spend. So why would you build wind turbines? Why would you build photovoltaics in areas where there's hardly any wind or hardly any sun? That's number one. Number two is we can bring them at scale. The investments are going into billions, if not in some areas into trillions for an entire country over may maybe more than a decade. Nonetheless, it is possible to run that energy transition. And that is exactly what Covestro is also driving. We want to become not only fully circular in terms of which materials we bring out there, but we also want to make sure that we reduce our scope 1, scope 2 and scope 3 carbon dioxide emissions. And that's why we're also pushing forward on our strategy to become really fully independent of fossil fuels as raw materials as well as on energy supply. And that's exactly what we're going for. In the near term, though, the reality is I think we're all going to live with higher energy prices. I mean, is it your expectation that this important input cost for you is just going to continue rising through the rest of this year? Well, it's going to continue rising. That's the big question out there. However, those prices have risen significantly. Just to give you an example, we paid in 2020 600 million for energy as Covestro. Last year it was 1.2 billion already. And this year we're expecting between 1.7 and 2 billion euros just on energy spend. So that shows you how big that order of magnitude is. What I expect is that those prices will not significantly come down in the, let's say, near future, maybe not even in the midterm future. However, the entire industry is affected of that and I believe Covestro is very well positioned because we have developed uh, low energy technologies and we have put them in place. Before it was just a tiny fraction of the competitiveness within Europe, but now it's getting a larger and larger, larger fraction of the cost, the total cost to, to produce, and that's why I feel very well uh, equipped, so to say. What really is for me the big question how competitive will Europe stay in a global context with those obviously um, um, high energy prices to stay? Yeah. We had the uh, city CEO uh, on the, the Global Outlook panel. Mm -hmm. She thinks Europe is definitely headed into recession this year. Mm -hmm. How does it look to you? Well, there is a high likelihood that we will see a recession. And uh, some of the key reasons are that we are in an inflationary environment, that also consumer confidence is going down. And that we also have seen a lot of spending, what I call, let's say, in the, in the real economy, real sector in recent years during the COVID pandemic. That means people have bought uh, monitors, they have re refurbished their house, they went into electronics and things like that. The, all that money is gone. And, and now people want to travel again. They maybe want to enjoy the service industry uh, again. So there's also, from that perspective, for me, um, limited opportunities to believe that there will be strong consumption. And that's why we will, that we will not, let's say, in the end of the day, have a high likelihood to go into a recession. Are we